hello everyone. Uh, it's Owen O'Shea here uh, to make a short presentation on some of the remarkable women of Common Amman, the women's organization, uh, which was very active in the War of Independence a century ago. Uh, and I've come across uh, many of their stories and many other stories indeed in my research uh, on the War of Independence, particularly in my own part of Mid Kerry uh, over the last while, uh, and particularly as the centenary of these events occurs around now. And some of the most interesting and, and probably overlooked stories that I've come across are those of the women of Common Amman, which uh, played probably an under uh, stated uh, and much overlooked at times role in the revolutionary period a century ago. And now thanks to the publication of many of their um, accounts from their pension applications, which have been published in recent years by the military archives, uh, we're now for the first time getting a real uh, and fuller insight into uh, the activities of these women and particularly how integral they were to the War of Independence and the Irish Revolution in supporting uh, the campaign of the IRA against the Crown Forces in uh, 1919 to 21. So uh, in this uh, short presentation, I've decided to focus on three women who were um, from the Kilgovnet area of Beaufort in Mid Kerry uh, and who were particularly active uh, during this period. And as I say, whose accounts have been published in uh, recent years and which I've had, I've spent some time researching and which are publicly available for every, for everyone to read and consider also. So I'd like to speak about uh, three women who were who were three neighbours from the Kilgobnet area, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and they are Mary Phil Sullivan, uh, who was later Mary Barrett uh, here on the left. Uh, Joan O'Brien in the centre, who was from uh, Glen Catan. Uh, Joan uh, was later uh, O'Sullivan. And finally, Josephine Jo Cashman, on the right, who was captain of the Kilgobnet uh, Common Amman. So to speak about uh, Common Amman very briefly, and I won't go into too much detail on this, but it, it was set up in 1914 and it was uh, uh, an organization for women. And its clear aim, as I've set out here, was to advance the cause of Irish liberty and to organize Irish women in the furtherance of this object. Uh, and from 1914 and in the years before the War of Independence, which began in 1919, uh, branches of Common Amman were formed all over the country uh, and they um, uh, were heavily involved in the events of 1916 and particularly uh, during the War of Independence uh, from um, in, in, in later years. In Kerry, a number of uh, branches were formed uh, in the years after uh, 1914 particularly in Killorton, and um, this is a wonderful photograph which uh, is held by the Killorton archives and which uh, shows us members of Killorton coming among. Uh, the year is, is not available, but it's believed to be around the time we're talking about. Um, and it um, just illustrates how, how organized they were, or at least in terms of presenting themselves in uniform. Uh, they were an org organized um, uh, organized in units across the county and across uh, the country. And uh, this, I think, illustrates um, some just how, how young many of them were at the time. Quite often, um, members of Common Amman joined the organization while they were still in school and while they were in their teens. And as we'd see, that's the case with, with, um, with some of the women I'm talking about today. So to refer briefly to the part of Kerry that I'm talking about, for anyone unfamiliar with Kilgobnet or Beaufort, um, the I've, I've illustrated here on this map where the three women I'm talking about came from. Uh, Joan uh, O'Brien, as I say, was from Glen Catan, uh, which is towards uh, Glen Carr. Uh, Joan Cashman, or Josephine Cashman, excuse me, came from Brook Hill, uh, Brook Hill Beaufort, uh, not far from Killorton. And um, Mary Phil Sullivan uh, was from Shanaclun, uh, just not too far uh, from Kilgobnet itself. Uh, Killarney would be to the east of this um, map and Killorton to the west and further south then you're into uh, Beaufort to Glencar and the McGillicuddy's Reeks. 
So as we can see, these three women were neighbours uh, in a rural area and uh, I'm sure were knew each other and joined the uh, joined Common Amon uh, in these years around the same time. Uh, firstly, to speak about uh, Joan O'Brien, uh, who was later uh, Joan O'Sullivan, and there can be confusion in the military archives sometimes because um, the women are referred to, if they were married, they're referred to by their married name, uh, which um, is because that's when they would have been applying for their pensions. Uh, so uh, I refer to her here as Joan O'Brien, even though she's listed as Joan O'Sullivan in the military archives. So Joan was born in 1894 and she lived until 1976 and she was from Glen Catan uh, in Kilgobnet, as I say, and she later lived for a while at Church Street, Cahar Sabine, uh, which uh, for reasons which we will talk about in a moment. So Joan O'Brien joined the Killordan branch of Cumann in 1918 and according to the accounts we have, she was engaged in activities such as dispatch work, that would be uh, carrying messages for the IRA and for volunteers. Uh, intelligence work, which I'll detail in, in a moment, which would be essentially gathering information and intelligence to help inform uh, the IRA campaign on the ground in Mid Kerry. Uh, first aid lessons, uh, frequently, uh, and in most cases, common among women were trained in first aid and were regularly called, as we shall see, to tend to wounded men. Uh, or wounded women and to um, administer first aid and uh, assist uh, with people who were wounded and injured in the conflict. And she was also involved in fundraising and quite often uh, you'll find in the accounts of Common Amman, fundraising was a key part of their work, uh, raising funds to support uh, the IRA campaign against the Crown Forces. So we know from Joan O'Brien's account that Chrissy Wade uh, in Killordan was her uh, company captain and the Wades indeed were a, a very Republican family and Chrissy Wade's sister uh, I've spoken about in a separate presentation on the Hillville ambush. Um, she was married to Sonny Mason of, um, of the Kiltala IRA uh, and uh, the Wade brothers were also uh, active in the IRA at this time. Uh, within the IRA then, uh, Joan O'Brien's commanding officer uh, locally would have been Tom O'Connor, pictured here on the right, who was a native of Milltown and who lived later for many years in Killordan and was the officer commanding at uh, the Bally McCandy ambush on the 1st of June 1921 uh, on which I'll be publishing a book uh, very soon. So Joan we know from her accounts was engaged in scouting and this was a critical part of uh, the work of common Amman women particularly when an ambush was being planned and organized uh, the women would be tasked with watching out for and keeping an eye on the movements of the RIC uh, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries as they moved from their barracks or as they travelled by bicycle or by road and they would alert the IRA to the movements of um, the Crown Forces and also tip them off when uh, the enemy was approaching. So we know from Joan's account, that, for example, that she was uh, she scouted ahead of the ambush of two Black and Tans um, who were killed. They were Constables Casely and Evans and they were killed at Hillville near Killordan on the 31st of October 1920 and I've done a separate a presentation on that which you can find on my uh, YouTube uh, channel and that attack involved the Kelnaversi and Lestray IRA so we can take it from uh, Joan's accounts that she would have kept a close eye on the movements of the police and of the Black and Tans uh, as, as they went about their business in Killordan and the Mid Kerry area and relayed the information about their movements to the uh, to the IRA and um, obviously, you know, that was quite a risky uh, practice to be engaged in. Uh, but for the most part, um, the women were able to, uh, I suppose, go undetected and weren't su suspected of activities like this uh, by the police as, as they went about their, their daily business. So we know from uh, Joan O'Brien's account that um, one of the ways in which she gathered intelligence from the IRA was from, through her workplace. And in her account, she explains that she worked as a barmaid in O'Shea's public house in Killordan. And this is a streetscape of uh, Killordan here in the background, uh, courtesy of the Killordan archives. And Joan, um, it, the, according to Joan O'Brien's account, the O'Shea's, uh, O'Shea's bar um, were what were described as friendly with the enemy forces and in fact used to entertain members of the Black and Tans. So uh, Joan, uh, who's referred here to as Miss O'Sullivan, Mrs. O'Sullivan, she was working in the bar and she would quite often uh, eavesdrop 
and listen to the conversations of the black and tans. She would know when they would come into the bar, when they would leave the bar. Uh, she would particularly be able to observe if they were intoxicated, as uh, the black and tans and the auxiliaries regularly, regularly were while on duty. Uh, so she would be able to pick up little tidbits of conversation from them by eavesdropping uh, on them in the bar and be, was able to relay that information uh, back to uh, common Amman, or, or sorry, to the to the IRA. So this is quite a quite an effective way uh, and, and one of the examples of how common Amman members at the time were able to pick up that kind of information simply by using the where they worked or who they were friendly with or who they knew to obtain information um, about uh, about uh, the movements of the black and tans. And as I said a moment ago, um, Joan's information uh, assisted the IRA in the uh, killing of two black and tans at Hillville uh, at, on the last day of October 1920. And uh, there were there were a number of reprisals and retaliation um, by the black and tans and the RIC in the hours and days after that attack. And Joan O'Brien, it m must have been suspected of being involved in in. Uh, in the scouting and the lead into the, the the ambush, because according to one of the accounts, um, the black and tans went to Glen Catan to Joan O'Brien's home, and she was, as you'll see here at the bottom, was taken out of her house to be shot by the tans. Um, but we do know that uh, Joan O'Brien managed to escape. Uh, she doesn't detail in her account what exactly happened there, but we do know that the house was uh, was raided by the black and tans and that she was facing execution uh, to be shot by, uh, for, for uh, her um, involvement in scouting ahead of the, uh, the Hillville ambush. Uh, but um, fortunately for uh, Joan O'Brien, she managed somehow to escape from um, the clutches of the Black and Tans and made her way to Cahir Savine. And uh, if anything, um, Joan O'Brien became more active um, in her in her um, in in common Amman when she moved to Cahir Savine, which was under the control of the Kerry Number no. Three Brigade, and there she managed to obtain uh, employment in Sullivan's Bar and Grocers, which was a well-known uh, meeting place for IRA um, IRA commanders locally. And I've pictured two of those men here because these are quite significant figures um, in the story of 1916 and the story of the subsequent revolution in Kerry. Uh, on the left is. Um, uh, Tom Clifford, who um, was uh, involved in the Easter Rising in Dublin, as was the gentleman on the right, uh, Dennis Daly, who um, was later a Fianna Fáil TD for South Kerry, uh, and was also or was among those who um, uh, drove through Kilorden uh, on Good Friday in 1916. And um, fortunately for Dennis Daly, he wasn't in the car that uh, drove off the end of Ballycasan Pier and. Uh, uh, and led to the drowning of three of the occupants. Uh, Dennis Daly was in the other car and made his way back to Dublin and was involved in the um, in the rising in subsequent days. But I'm I'm mentioning the two of them simply to illustrate how um, um, how Joan O'Brien was um, involved in this period with uh, men of such experience and of such uh, stature within the uh, within the IRA. So we know from the accounts that uh, after she moved to Carsevine, uh, Joan supplied IRA training camps in South Kerry with food and supplies. Uh, during the Civil War, she managed to secure bullets from a free state, state soldier. How uh, it is not specified, but um, somehow she managed to uh, um, relieve a free state soldier of some of his ammunition. Uh, and, and also, according to her accounts <coughs> and other accounts in the archives, she attended to an IRA man <coughs> excuse me, who was wounded at Ohrmong near Carsevine. And again, um, we can see how Joan O'Brien's life was put in danger uh, during the Civil War here because um, after that incident at Ohrmong, um, Captain Singleton, who was with the Free State Army, uh, picked up Joan O'Brien and other members of Cumann Amman and Carsevine, drove them several miles out of the town and dropped them on the side of the road and warned them not to return to Carsevine. Now, it appears that Joan and her uh, comrades did because she was arrested the following day and imprisoned on Valencia Island uh, with other members of Common Amman and took part in a hunger strike, uh, which lasted for about a fortnight. Uh, and now we, we, we often associate hunger strikes with the men uh, of the IRA, but um, this is certainly one of the unusual examples, I suppose, uh, not unique by any means, but unusual examples of 
of a woman going on hunger strike and a member of, of Common Amman going on hunger strike. And certainly the first I've come across uh, among members of Common Amman in mid Kerry. Uh, but after two weeks, uh, she was released and uh, again, she was denied uh, the opportunity to come back into Karsavine and she was forced to go on the run from October 1922 until May 1923 when the civil war came to an end. So uh, again, um, quite an extraordinary uh, story and quite an extraordinary tale of how uh, she often put her life uh, and safety at risk um, in uh, her uh, membership of Common Amman. What we get from the uh, military archives uh, was when in subsequent years, in many, many years later, when the women applied for pensions uh, in recognition of their role in the revolution, is we, we get testimonies and we get um, almost references, if you like, from people who would have known the applicant and uh, part of the um, requirements for a pension was to get testimony and references from uh, senior uh, figures within your own organization about what you did and when you did it and who you did it with so that uh, the um, assessors <coughs> with the Department of Defense could make um, an assessment of whether you um, qualified for a pension or not. So these are just examples from the file of Joan O'Brien. Um, where Sho who was with the IRA, IRA in South Kerry, said she was a very reliable person and often put herself in danger carrying out instructions given her. Uh, from Michael Pierce, in my opinion, she was the most active member of Common Amman in that area. <coughs> then from Maraban Ishukraha, who was with Common Amman, uh, she said of Joan O'Brien that she did everything possible during the tan time. And Dan Mulvihill of the IRA, who was from uh, Castlemaine, said that uh, she never shirked any duties, no matter how dangerous, and carried on until the end of the Civil War. So these are just examples of some of the accounts uh, that we have on uh, Joan O'Brien's uh, pension application, which she eventually qualified for many years after the conflict. The second woman I want to talk about um, briefly is Mary Phil Sullivan uh, from Shanna um, near Beaufort, and she was born in 1904, uh, died in 1981. And she later lived at uh, and, and married and lived at uh, Killaclahan uh, near Milltown. Uh, Mary Phil Sullivan uh, was very young when she joined Cumann Amman. She joined in 1920 while she was still attending school. And according to her pension file, she says that she was involved again, like uh, John O'Brien, carrying dispatches, catering, supplying food and provisions to men in dugouts and on the run attending to minor injuries and supplying information on troop and RIC movements. So again, gathering intelligence and supplying that information to the IRA. Uh, Mary Phil Sullivan states that she carried a bundle of ammunition for an ambush at Beaufort, which I'll mention in a moment, and she kept an IRA, uh, kept an eye on an arms dump near her home. Again, um, the homes and um, farms and sheds and outhouses of women in Common Amman were regularly used to store guns and ammunition for the IRA. So their task would have been to keep an eye on, on that uh, ammunition and, and those weapons, sometimes at great risk to themselves, obviously, um, being involved with, you know, live ammunition and uh, and uh, guns and so forth. Um, in the During the truce then between the War of Independence and the Civil War, uh, Mary Phil Sullivan says she uh, attended a Common Amman training camp at Ardlahas, which is near Kilcobnet, and she was also involved in drilling, training and, and learning first aid. And her activities continued during the Civil War. And just here on the right, I have a, an extract from her account. It's, it appears that one of the ways in which Mary Phil Sullivan gathered intelligence about the police and about the Black and Tans was from children who were going to school. And clearly, um, Mary Phil Sullivan, who was quite young and um, in her, I think she was about 16 or 17 when she joined Common Amman, was able to develop contacts and conversations with the children of local police officers, police constables, or black and tan members, and to pick up little bits of information from them about what their fathers, where they lived, what they were doing, what their movements were. Uh, and she was able to use that information to great effect and relay it back again to the IRA. And she was also, like Joan O'Brien, involved in scouting ahead of that Hillville ambush uh, that I mentioned a, a moment ago. The, the Beaufort Bridge ambush that um, I mentioned that um, Mary Phil Sullivan was involved in gathering intelligence for uh, was in August 1920. And that involved senior figures like uh, Charlie Daly, uh, who was later killed during the Civil War, Dan Alman from Lestray, who was um, killed during the, um, the Headford ambush, and Jimmy Cronin uh, from um, from Brackhill originally and later from Milltown, uh, who was a member of the IRA company there. 
and uh, there are accounts of that, uh, uh, some of some of which I've detailed on my on my website for anybody who'd like to um, to uh, learn more about that. Uh, this is a picture of Mary Phil Sullivan in later life, and she married uh, Edward Barrett from um, uh, Woodville or from Killaglahan in Milltown, and he was a senior figure in the um, Milltown IRA company at the time. And it's not unusual that members of Common Amon uh, occasionally married uh, IRA men. Um, uh, and what we do see quite regularly is that where um, a man was involved in the IRA, his wife or partner or sisters were involved in Common Amon. And likewise, if a woman was involved in Common Amon, it was quite often that I suppose relationships were established and um, uh, often led to, uh, to marriage. And this is one such instance. Um, where, where Edward Barrett um, married uh, Mary Phil Sullivan and she later lived with him at his home at, uh, at, at, at uh, Milltown. And he was, as I said earlier, a, a member of um, the, uh, the Milltown company, which was one of those companies involved in the Ballymacandy ambush between Milltown and Castlemaine on the 1st of June 1921. And uh, finally, uh, Josephine Jo Cashman, uh, who was born in 1900. She was from uh, Brook Hill in Beaufort, and her family also had a house, and, and some of them lived uh, in the Black Valley uh, near Beaufort, which is through the Gap of Dunlow. Uh, and Josephine is important in the sense that she was the captain of the Kilgobnet Company uh, of Common Amman. And again, from her own pension accounts, uh, she hosted and catered for IRA meetings. Uh, on one occasion, she carried a gun uh, on the train to Tralee to transport it to the IRA there. She was involved in drilling, uh, parades, fundraising, making shot. And making shot means making ammunition, which was quite a risky uh, process at the time. Uh, and there are a number of accounts of people being killed uh, accidentally in the process of making shot and making uh, gunpowder for use in guns. So that was a, quite a risky and dangerous practice. Again, um, like her, uh, her comrades, Joe Cashman was involved in scouting ahead of the ambush at Hillville and also an attack near Ballycassan uh, on two black and tans um, in, uh, in 1921. And during the Civil War, again, uh, Joe Cashman uh, attended training. She billeted men on the run. That's kept them in her home and looked after them, carried messages. And she also, in, uh, according to the, the archives, uh, nursed two men uh, who were wounded at Cahir Savine Workhouse during the Civil War. Again, we have um, numerous testimonies and um, references in support of uh, Joe Cashman's pension application when she did apply later in, 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 um, in her life uh, for a pension to the Department of Defence. And one such account here is a handwritten note from Dan Mulvihill, uh, who was uh, in the Milltown Company of the IRA and a very senior figure in the IRA in, in Mid Kerry. And he wrote that um, Joe Cashman was consistently in charge of arms and ammunition and did, did a lot of intelligence work. And again, those, those accounts and those uh, documents are readily available and free to access on the Military Archives site. Uh, one of the, I suppose, more um, perhaps uh, morbid aspects of the uh, military files and the pension applications is that we do get details of when um, an applicant passed away and invariably they include the last um, check that would have been sent out to, um, in this case, Joe Cashman, who was later lived in Dublin. Uh, she was a, a, a teacher. She had been principal of Gorton Scree a National School uh, near Beaufort, near Clordland, and then uh, worked later as a teacher in Dublin. But here we have, um, quite poignantly, I suppose, the final check that was posted out by the Department of Defence in 1977 and which was cancelled because um, Joe Cashman at this point had passed away. And on the file also we have um, a copy of uh, the invoice from the undertakers who would have handled her funeral because uh, pension applicants were entitled, or at least their families were entitled to apply uh, for a grant towards the funeral expenses uh, of those who'd been, who'd been successful in um, securing pensions over the years. So it's um, perhaps a little bit, as I say, morbid, but these are, um, these are, this is the level of detail that we do get from um, the pension application files. 
So uh, just briefly for the record, uh, Joan O'Brien, uh, many years later, and it did take quite a number of years before Common Amman were included and were um, Common Amman members were permitted to apply for pensions. But uh, Joan O'Brien was recognised um, for four and a half years service with Common Amman, and she qualified for her pension in 1953. Mary Phil Sullivan for two and a quarter years service. Uh, her uh, payment was received in 1943. And Joe Cashman was awarded for almost two years service in 1942. But as I've said in other um, presentations, uh, quite often the the requirements uh, in terms of qualifying for the pension and the lengthy correspondence and uh, toing and froing that members of Common Amman and the IRA indeed had to go to uh, to prove eligibility for pensions was quite um, quite onerous. And uh, in fact, in, in most cases, pension applicants were turned down. So the, the, the threshold <coughs> for proving uh, that you are qualified and eligible for a pension for uh, your activity in this period was very high. As I said, uh, the military archives site is a tremendous resource. Every document I've shown you here and all of the accounts I've referenced are available on the military archives site. Uh, there are brigade activity reports. Uh, there are the pension applications. There are the witness statements from the Euro Bureau of Military History. It's very navigable, very searchable. And really, uh, it's thanks to the incredible work of the military archives in recent years who have digitized uh, the hard copy files that were stored for many years and who've made them available now uh, online and so easy to navigate and to research that we're able to tell the stories of people like uh, uh, Mary Phil Sullivan, Joan O'Brien and Joe Cashman. I have uh, a couple of other videos like this uh, on my YouTube channel. One is on the Hillville ambush in which the three women I mention uh, here uh, are referenced as well. And I've also told the story of another member of Common Amman uh, from my own parish, uh, who was Annie Cronin, uh, who was uh, one of those who was uh, involved in the Ballymacandy ambush uh, near her home in June in 1921. So if you'd like to learn more about either of those topics, the videos are there. Uh, I'll be publishing uh, soon uh, in, in May of 2021 uh, a book on the Ballymacandy ambush, uh, which uh, happened near my home a uh, hundred years ago and which I hope um, if anybody's interested in picking up a copy it's available uh, via my website or will be when it's uh, published very soon and um, on my website you can find more information including my contact details uh, and I'd love to hear from anybody who has in for any more information about the women I spoke about here uh, or indeed any other information about the War of Independence a um, hundred years ago in Mid Kerry uh, because I think it's important that a century on from this turbulent uh, time in our history that we come to embrace and learn more about what the ordinary men and women from our uh, communities and our parishes were involved in uh, a century ago, even if they rarely spoke about it in later life or uh, for obvious reasons were maybe upset or traumatised by what had occurred. Uh, it was, it's important to know that their stories are being told uh, and I'm glad to have uh, made that short presentation to you on three uh, of the women from the Kilcomnish area who were so active in the revolution a century ago. Uh, I hope you found this of interest. Uh, please like or subscribe to my um, YouTube channel and you can also subscribe to uh, my blog via my website. Uh, thank you for listening and watching and talk to you very soon. Goramila Mahagwaif.